Let's pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Oops. Ah, my sermon slides are not there. We'll do without them. <laughs> all right, well, I wonder how many of you are familiar with this little letter from Paul? It's by far the shortest of Paul's letters, only 25 verses long, not even a chapter division, and less than 350 words in the original Greek. It's so short that you can easily flip right past it without even seeing it, right at the end of Paul's letters. Indeed, some wonder why this little personal letter between Paul and this man named Philemon is in the Bible at all. But there is a very important reason why Philemon was included in the New Testament. And this reason is tied up closely in how this letter connects with and helps us understand the final section to Paul's letter to the Colossians that we'll get to next week. The reason this letter is so important is because it is about slavery and the implications of the gospel of Jesus for both slave owner and those who are quite literally enslaved. This is important specifically to Colossians because that letter also refers to slavery. But on an even more basic and essential level, Philemon was written to a household that was a part of the church in Colossae. While Philemon isn't directly mentioned in Colossians, Archippus is, who is a member of Philemon's household in those opening verses. It's not entirely clear whether Archippus is Philemon's son and Aphia is Philemon's wife, though, I mean, they could have been siblings, but they are definitely a family living in one household central to the church in Colossae. But by far the clearest connection to Colossians is the person at the center of this letter, Onesimus. In Colossians 4, he is mentioned as one of the people who brought that letter to Colossae from Paul. There's a good chance then that Colossians and Philemon were delivered together. One to the whole church community in Colossae, the other just to the house church group that met at Philemon's house. And who was Philemon? Well, right away the letter tells us that he was fairly well off and probably a person of some status in the larger Colossian community, since his house was large enough to be, the, to be one of the meeting places for that new and very small church in Colossae. That and the fact that he owned at least one slave. That was the measure of whether you were poor or of a, a higher social status, owning a slave. From the praise Paul heaps on him, we do know that Philemon is a person of good character and well respected in the early Christian movement. Paul says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. And he goes on to say, your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. This is high praise from Paul. And I think Paul is being completely sincere here. Paul doesn't say things just to make people feel good about themselves. He says what he means. But as we see, he offers this praise also for a very practical reason to take some of the edge off the challenging request he is about to make. Indeed, he says, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Indeed, what Paul has to say in Philemon, to Philemon is not really a request. It's ultimately something Paul believes that he is called to do by God, something Philemon should do because of his faith in Jesus. Yet Paul does not give it as a straight-up command. Instead, he writes this letter to persuade Philemon out of the mutual love they have for Jesus. 
and the fact that they are both Jesus' disciples and fellow brothers in Christ. Indeed, partners in this ministry. That's a, a key word in, in this letter, partnership. Paul here clearly speaks as the older brother, a senior partner, and a spiritual father, the one who brought Philemon to faith in Jesus. But though at times he, he, he lays it on, he tries as much as possible to do it as lightly as possible with this authority that he has. Now part of Paul's reason for this approach is that this is the Christian way of using authority. It is humble, loving, and seeks to persuade rather than dominate. This letter is a tremendous example of how Christian leaders, or indeed any Christians, uh, should use their personal authority to call other Christians to live more faithfully and be more deeply transformed by the gospel. The other reason for Paul's approach is that he is dealing with a very delicate and potentially explosive issue, and one that no Greek or Roman would see as a problem, and that is, of course, as we've said, slavery. The letter indicates that Onesimus is a slave who escaped from Philemon and went on the run. Complicating the matter is the hint that when he escaped, Onesimus may have stolen from his master to pay for his travel. While on the run, Onesimus met Paul, or indeed he may have gone directly to Paul as someone that he had heard about from his master, as someone who might give him shelter. Under Paul's mentorship, Onesimus has now become a faithful Christian who has proven to be a tremendous help to Paul while well, Paul is in prison for the gospel. Now the obvious request Paul makes in this letter that's abundantly clear is for Onesimus to be taken back into Philemon's household without any consequences and for the two to be fully reconciled. Now this would be a big ask in and of itself in this context. In sla escaped slaves upon capture or even if they voluntarily returned home could usually expect to be beaten, forced at times to wear an iron collar, marking them out as a bad slave. They could also be branded on their faces or even be executed by their masters in some rare cases. But while forgiveness and full reconciliation was a very significant and weighty request, Paul goes further. He subtly but firmly suggests that Philemon should give Onesimus his freedom. Now, not everyone agrees on this interpretation of the letter. Because of Paul's care in handling this explosive issue, it's possible to interpret the letter to Philemon in a few different ways. In fact, the meaning of Philemon was a major point of dispute between abolitionists and slaveholders in the 18th and 19th centuries. So this was, at one time, this was a very well-known letter because of the place that it held in a debate that shook Western society. However, I agree very strongly with those who believe that Paul is telling Philemon to set Onesimus free. I believe that this is the right way to read the letter. Central to Paul's presentation of his gospel is his declaration that he makes in Galatians chapter 3, that there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. This is a central implication of the gospel for Paul. And here in his letter, Paul is calling on Philemon to put this theological truth into very real practice and in a costly way. Now, living as we do in a time when slavery is recognized as a terrible evil, we probably wonder why Paul is so subtle and delicate in addressing a basic injustice. Why doesn't he just come out and, and tell Philemon to free Onesimus and be done with it? Well, again, the reason is that this was a huge ethical blind spot in Greek and Roman society. Quite literally, no one in this time thought that slavery was wrong. In fact, slavery was a fundamental part of every single ancient human civilization 
from the very beginning up until the modern period. I think it's important for us to wrap our minds around this. The only real debate in Roman society, for instance, was whether slaves were human beings or not. And the majority view was that they were not human beings. In many ways, the average Greek or Roman slave owner thought of their slaves as we might think of our appliances. If you have money, you have them. And they do save a lot of work around the house. In fact, the great Greek philosopher Aristotle had explicitly said slaves were not people. Rather, they were either living tools or property with souls. Now, by the time Paul wrote this letter, there was one group of pagan philosophers called the Stoics who were arguing that while slaves weren't fully people, they should at least be treated with decency, that they shouldn't be killed or crippled for no reason. That was a new idea. And not everybody went along with it. As I indicated a moment ago, under Roman law, a master could do almost anything to their slaves with no legal repercussions. Though by the first century, popular opinion tended to frown on killing them outright. But if you did, there was no legal consequence. So let me say again, Paul is dealing with a major moral blind spot here. Masters would free good and faithful slaves, or those who had worked hard and saved up the money to buy their freedom. But they certainly didn't free runaways. In the eyes of everyone, anyone living at that time, Onesimus was the one who was clearly in the wrong. And Paul was already asking a lot of Philemon just to take him back and treat him kindly. If he freed this runaway slave, Philemon would likely be a laughing stock to his neighbors, rewarding his property for running away. And, and they might even be angry because Philemon was perhaps giving other slaves ideas. Now we should also notice that this isn't the blind spot of a morally ambiguous individual or a great sinner. As Paul tells us, Philemon is a good person, characterized by love and a deep faith in Jesus. He's given his house to be used by this new church in Colossae, and he's probably an elder, if not something like the local pastor of the group that meets in his house. Paul is addressing the significant blind spot of a mature Christian leader. And this is one message I think the letter to Philemon has for Christians today very broadly. Having faith in Christ and accepting Jesus as our Lord means that our lives will be changed in ways perhaps that we cannot imagine. Even if we think of ourselves as relatively good people. We all have blind spots. Furthermore, this change doesn't just happen when we first come to faith. It's a change that extends and deepens throughout our life in Christ. Even when we think we are already good and faithful Christians. Even if we have been Christians our entire lives, we can expect to be challenged and changed by Jesus, often in ways that, again, we might never expect, particularly at the beginning. And that's because, again, we all have blind spots. We all have areas in our lives that we think are perfectly fine and good, but which may need to be changed by the light of the gospel. And whether we realize it or not, some of these blind spots can be pretty major and will require some very difficult changes. In fact, this change may even make us seem strange or foolish to people around us. Just ask Philemon. Like him, there are plenty of things that our society thinks are normal and good, or at least practical necessities that are just not acceptable in the full light of the new life that we have in Jesus. I'm not going to make any broad statements about what that may or may not be today. And indeed, many blind spots can just be ones we have as individuals. But the truth is there are many things that we as modern Canadians are entirely comfortable with that we probably should set aside or at least question in the light of who Jesus is and what the gospel is about. 
Now, it'll likely come as a relief to most of us that this is a journey and that God doesn't always ask for deep, dramatic, difficult, and costly change right out of the gate. Actually, God most often is patient and generous with us. This is something we can see in Philemon on its own, but particularly when we read it alongside Colossians. And this is because Paul's general instructions to the Colossian slave owners, the masters, in general, is much less radical than his specific appeal to Philemon. There, Paul simply says, Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, for you know that you also have a master in heaven. It's uh, Colossians 4.1. Now, this is, again, a good deal less than Paul asks from Philemon. And it seems especially light as it comes after directions for slaves to obey their earthly masters and to faithfully carry out their work. Now, this, is, this passage in particular, which, again, we'll get to next week, has often seemed troubling to modern readers of the Bible, and I know it sticks in my throat a little bit when I have to read it out loud. Yet, this comes down to what we were talking about earlier. No one in the first century AD anywhere thought slavery was wrong. In fact, no one other than the Stoics felt that masters had any responsibility to treat their slaves with decency. Even in this statement, Paul and the Bible are pushing against the deep-seated beliefs of their society. Much of how Paul deals with slavery then comes down to practical necessity. Paul and the first Christians were a tiny minority of a minority. They had no ability to change public opinion or rewrite laws. Indeed, as we see from Philemon, they were still learning how to change their own minds. Yet Paul's approach includes more than just a practical concession to reality. It was also a pastoral one. Philemon tells us that Paul's ultimate hope was for Christian masters to see their slaves first as brothers and then set them free. Because the gospel of Jesus and the story of the God of Israel is about freedom. Yet it took time and grace for people to get there. It took time. Remember, Paul is dealing with probably his most advanced student in Colossae, the person who he also has the deepest personal relationship with. And it's on the basis of that relationship that he is able to say, again, there are, there are, there are points in the letter where Paul flexes that relationship and stresses the personal authority. But when it comes to the request, he frames it as persuasion. He says, perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And he leaves it up to Philemon. He says, I trust that you will do what I ask. And even more. Now, I think, given that Philemon, the letter to Philemon was preserved by the Colossian church rather than thrown in the fire, I think tells us that Philemon did what Paul asked. And this little letter would influence how Christians over time thought about slavery. How they eased the conditions of slavery in the later Roman Empire. In some parts, got rid of it for a season in northern Europe, and then when it came back again in the 18th and 19th century, this little seed planted so long ago bore fruit in the abolition movement. And that's where, again, I want to stress that it's important for us as Christians today to understand that the Bible does not support slavery. Sometimes you'll hear secular people say that. Sometimes you'll hear well-meaning progressive Christians say that. But I and many others believe that the Bible, when read properly, is a document for freedom. It acknowledges society as it was when it was composed, when the word of God was first given, and yet through its trajectory it points to freedom. God is the God of the Exodus, the God who sets the slaves free, his people free in Egypt. He is the God who sets us free from sin, sin and death in Christ, and he is the God who wills that all people be free. 
it's important to understand this as we look at the Bible and not be misled uh, by, again, some of the more challenging passages. But that does bring us finally to, again, what does this say to us today? And I think it does, as I've said earlier, invite us to think about how the gospel interacts with where we are as a culture. Are there things that we are used to, that we do, that we don't even think about, that perhaps is not the way of Jesus? And if we are convicted about those things, how do we persuade and talk to other Christians about it in a way that is Christ-like, humble, and effective? And I think there is so much that we have to learn about this when we look at Philemon and we look at Colossians and see the change that God can work through a little letter sent to a house in a town in Turkey 2,000 years ago and the effect that it had. The word of God always bears fruit, both in its own time and in God's time. And thanks be to God for that. Amen.